and it says that it's recording, which means that we can give this another go, Rob. I'm crossing my fingers. Okay. So I think I I might uh, minimize. Well, I do want to see what you're doing. Speaking of which, person I haven't said your name yet, Jersey Drozd of LeanIntoArt.com and ComicsAreGreat.com. That's yeah. me. And then that guy over there is Rob Stenzinger of Interactive-Storyteller.com and LeanIntoArt.com. Hi, Rob. Hey, Jersey. So, so we're going to do some drawing, drawing today for this video yeah. episode. We're going to try to do some drawing today. We may be a little um, skittish because we are uh, hoping our technology works and we're crossing our fingers. We've had a few hiccups. And but I, I feel good about this run. I think this is going to be it. This will be the Lean Into Art episode twenty nine right now. All right. Call. What's that? I said I'm calling it. Ah, I see. So you're 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 being brave. Yeah, as if my gumption and attitude has any effect on the technology. But it's fun to pretend. So, yeah, just going back to our episode about control, the illusion of control. It's totally, totally the illusion of control. So, um, so yeah, we're gonna give it. We're gonna give another video episode a try, and you know, we'll see. Um, but, but one of the fun things we wanted to do with this this podcast series is alternate between audio discussions and then video demos of things uh, while we discuss something. And uh, I think Rob, you proposed this topic. Uh, the idea of doing uh, picking some things that we have trouble with and discussing how we figure our way out of them or not could be something that we're yeah. still having trouble with. Like, well, and uh, specifically when, you know, with drawing as opposed to, you know, un an untrustworthy kitchen appliance or whatnot. It's, it's when, when <laughs> there's some subject matter of, uh, that you just, you're, you're trying to, to draw convincingly and uh, you know you get stuck, and obviously you have to deal with it. I mean, if it's if it's in a comic that you're putting out weekly, I bet you may have, you know, some some approaches that that help you just cope, maybe. But then you know, sure. I think there's other things there too. Um, I know some battles for me are actually fairly um, fairly extended challenges that I that are ongoing. Um, just kind of jumping into it. Um, clothing, fashion. Mm. It's it's tough as as far as like uh, dressing my characters and coming up with um, sort of outfits that are convincing and interesting and uh, more relevant than just sort of you know everyone's got the the nondescript uh, t-shirt right. Mm -hmm. um, of which um, I am having some really severe performance uh, slugginess on my uh, machine here, but I'll just try to draw slower and see how it goes. So you can, you know, just put everyone in a good old, uh, good old T-shirt, right? But then, yeah. What about you know putting stuff on it and and then or when it just isn't appropriate? It's like, well, I have a person who's who's the dean of a school here, probably not coming to work in a T-shirt. And, uh, Probably not. Yeah. So. So I'm curious. I'm curious. I mean, do you do you um, ever look up uh, like get like fashion catalogs or like clothing catalogs from like Sears and Macy's and Delia's and Abercrombie and Fitch or anything like that? I or do those websites. I, um, I think part of the part of the challenge is is um, like I'll sit around and I'll put in maybe. Any, anywhere from like five to minutes to a hundred minutes into a into a drawing, like maybe while I'm you know relaxing, watching TV with my wife or whatnot. And um, but sometimes when I'm doing that practice, I don't always um, I don't know, like maybe it maybe it's a uh, having a uh, those kind of materials more at the ready because when I'm actually putting out a comic. I often start leaning on different crutches that uh, um, 
there's sort of like this really oversimplified clothing vocabulary that I've built up. Um, you know, jeans, t-shirts, uh, long sleeve mm-hmm. shirts, turtlenecks, um, the certain types of blouses for women. Um, not a whole lot of variety, right? So then, then I may go like in a bit of a fantasy direction now and then as far as someone who's a little more barbaric or heroic or something, but, um, but that's pretty rare. It, it, um, yeah. So you never, do you never done anything like where you like try to, uh, think about like an outfit for a character where you get to draw like a certain kind of line or anything like that? No, I haven't yet. Um, Cause that's something I like to do. That's a way I like to challenge myself is like, for instance, okay, so I'm doing this thing on my screen right now um, where I'm a big fan of trying to define the contour of a figure with one line if possible. So like I'll go back to my inking layer. So if I can do one swooshy line like that mm-hmm. to define my character, I feel really happy. It feels really good to me for some reason. Um, and then so then I say, well, I really like drawing these swooshy lines. So what kind of outfits can I look up to figure out swooshy lines? And I was looking at, um, I went to Delia's, the, the college girl. Oh, I'll write down the name. It's a, it's a clothing. Delia's. Come on, S. Um, it's, it's a college clothing company, right? They, they, they really mu- pretty much market to like 19-year-old girls. And so I was like, well, what are they wearing this year? And I found this like scoop neck thing that the girl's wearing with like these big blousey uh, at the elbow sleeves, but it's like knit. And then like, of course, like the elastic band at the mid forearm uh, kind of reminded me like the flash dance kind of look. Remember that? Oh, yeah, totally. And I was like, bingo, there it is. That looks really, you know, I get to draw this kind of line now, this like swooshy thing. And so I, I was working on some character designs for a new project and. Sure enough, and then when I was working on the uh, the character, I got down to the the waist area, and then I, you know, I'm rendering her legs, and I'm like, well, I wonder what kind of things I can do to get those swooshy lines on the legs. And so, hmm. you know, pencil them in. Oh God, these feet are terrible. Uh, and then I thought, well, cool. If she's already got this flash dance thing going on here, it's not an arrow. I had to draw slowly while doing this in Connect. Um, I thought, well, why not just go all out, do some big old leg warmers, some swooshy lines there. And I really liked the look that I came up with. Oh, yeah. It's really nice. So it all came out of, I mean, it literally just came out of like, okay, what can I draw that has swooshy lines, right? And so she had like, I get to do like this outer contour, like I like to do. And so sometimes that'll give me inspiration for clothing. Right, it's like nice. how where to investigate into clothing because like I'll tell you a lot of the the stuff that was on the look at a giant list of clothing and think well what fits but so you're going into it with almost like a um like a sort of a, a design constraint that you want to have the 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 swooshy look for this character so because it's somehow informing your feeling you're getting from them you know whereas mm-hmm. you maybe versus you know something that's more fuzzy or 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 or, or sharp and plate looking or spiky stuff like that or yeah right i could also just as easily do like you know and try to draw another female figure female ish figure this is running really slow and sluggish so um you know if i was going to do say like an older woman character somebody in her like you know late 30s early 40s um, maybe more of a power suit kind of thing, then yeah, I'm going to think of sharp lines. But I'm also going to think about graceful contour, right? And then I'm going to go, oh, well, maybe I'll look up I'll look up some dresses and I'll find something with a nice kind of like uh, bunched up scoop neck thing, sleeveless, split here, get the nice straight shoulder look, but then... And then... Oh, I'm running out of uh, board here. But then per- perhaps, you know, let's look at look what kind of shoes could go along with this kind of thing. Oh, maybe some kind of like high-legged boot. <clears throat> but that that's how I'll get my uh, initial inspiration is I'll think, okay, so older woman, I'm going to think of sharp lines and then a long contour. And then for this younger girl, I thought, well, swooshy, blousey. Uh, what can I find that's, that, that, that help? Uh, like as you were saying, like like reduce my number of choices. 
constraint. Exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah finding some kind of constraint because otherwise it's, I mean, you do a Google image search or I actually have, um, uh, I, I, I don't know, a few years back I was really funding a lot of different, um, I, I would buy a lot of resource material for um, for a video game I was working on and inspiring the the look of different things and 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 I was probably investing too much time in these different side pursuits as opposed to you know doing that versus making the darn game but um, I have built up this pretty sweet library of different cultural reference material and um, you know anything from from sort of societies of you know desert lands to gothic architecture to um, just a book talking about architecture to, I don't know, different animals of the jungle, stuff like that, where it's, I don't have to do a Google image search. I've got sort of this, um, an, an interesting library of, of, of things that, uh, it's not, you know, too insane. It's a few, couple of bookshelves, no big deal, but, uh, it's, uh, yeah, helpful source material. But at the same time, I, I, one area it's weak is this, is, is fashion specifically. Um, but I can see that being really helpful if, if you're going to say, well, all right, this character, I really want to emphasize their their uh, mm, mellow, happy nature, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to go with the, some clothing that's not all sleek and tight, but it's going to be you know loose but flowy. Right. Well, here's a classic character we can talk about who had if, how long it takes before you recognize him with my slow, crude drawing. Shaggy. Yeah, exactly. And look at his clothing style, right? Yeah. That is. Got the V-neck shirt. My clothing vocabulary. What's that? That's eighty percent of my clothing vocabulary. <laughs> the the long uh, kind of loose V-neck shirt. Yep. But uh, but yeah, I'm not to actually erase my canvas here because I'm running out of space. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, it, it's it's funny. You don't think about this. Uh, it's, maybe, maybe I don't know. I'm not going to say you don't think about this, but it, it's, e it's an easy thing to overlook is that uh, it's going to come out of their, the character's personality, right? And, and even the way two different characters wear suits is going to be different. So, um, and then you got to think about the body type. Is this going to be a fairly rotund character? Mm -hmm. And is this character who's rotund, do they accept the fact that they're rotund and wear appropriately sized clothing? Or mm -hmm. are they, you know, wearing the clothes from like seven years ago before they gained all this weight? And so is it going to be something where it's very tight? Everything's going to be bunched up at the corners? Sure. Yep. Not quite long enough. Stretched. Yeah, not quite long enough, right? Which is going to say something different about the character than if they wear something that's actually like tailor made for them, right? Versus, yeah, say, let's go to this one, where it'd be more. Oops. Let me go in. This is more now. I've got the kingpin from Marvel Comics, right? Oh yeah, yep. Kingpin is obviously a comfortably dressed, confident person. Yeah, yeah and they always did like a big case out of making those slacks very drapey. So yeah, yeah, two totally different ways to go about it, and it all depends on what the character's inner life is, right? Yep. So, another thing that uh, Amy Kim Kibuishi uh, once told me is uh, layering, like thinking layers, and that that really unlocked a lot of stuff for me. It's like, yeah, of course, I mean, people wear layers, and we should be thinking about how these layers interact with one another, right? Um, Absolutely. It's ducking you again, Rob. So, what'd you say? Oh, absolutely. It, uh, it basically breaking down the larger problem into smaller ones and using something that you do know to help discover the things that you don't know. It's like a 
it's a foundation to reach off into research and filtering what could be a sea of, of um, puzzling information. Um, Hmm. But is it is it so for you is it like it's a it's an imagination thing is it it's like it's like well I don't know what to put on this person so I'm just gonna go to my default and it's gonna be oh, t-shirts and no, jeans it's, it's sort of a, or I'll just sort of imagine a rough approximation of of the power suit I mean so if um, if I am doing a power suit I will sort of do the it's a little bit it's like part power part suit part tight shirt not quite a suit. It it uh, they're wearing a collared shirt underneath something that looks maybe like it came out of the Fifth Element movie, not necessarily. Um, I'm not trying to be overly harsh about like you know my drawing or whatever. It, it just I know I need to research these things more and uh, and ex expand my vocabulary there. I'm I've leaning too much. I'm leaning too much on my my uh, uh, cheats. Or, or crutches or things that 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 just don't fully represent the 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 character where i i realize now that this clothing is information that could be reinforcing the character and helping me achieve my communication goals as a storyteller this is going to seem neurotic oh, and i know my student sorry excuse me what's that no um <clears throat> i was a little worried about a uh, a visiting cat that jumped on a keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, situation solved. Oh, okay, awesome. So nothing's damaged. Thankfully, if I'm yeah. still here, oh, it's all good. So, all right. Okay. Um, um, no, no, this is going to really seem good. a little neurotic. And I, I, I know this, this always bums my students out. Uh, when I tell them this, but you know, the whole principle of drawing through, right? So it's like, if you're going to draw, Oh man, I'm gonna do this slowly because it makes it Adobe Connect mad. Let's say you're gonna draw the crossbody punch, and you start with your good old big figure and build out. Here's the shoulder. Here's the upper arm. There's the arm crossing over, and then this arm comes back, and then there's the wind up arm, right? And they tell you in those how to draw books. To draw through your character because otherwise you're going to misplace elements or you you run the risk of misplacing elements right mm -hmm. you know what i'm talking about absolutely um, it's uh yeah you have a 3d so, shape in space as opposed to your flattened over summarized version of that shape so then um, yes so then when you ink it yeah so then when you ink it you know where everything is supposed to be so i can put the character's head here and I know not to draw the rest of that arm there, right? And then I've got a reasonable approximation of a human figure throwing a punch. Mm -hmm. And actually, this would be the leg that goes back. See, this is another reason to draw through. Anyway, so, uh, so here's where my students go, oh, come on, you're kidding me, is when I'm doing my pencils, I'll actually pencil the anatomy like this. And then I'll put mm -hmm. the clothing on top of it, like I did here in red. And then I'll put layers. So after I, I'll draw the whole shirt, and then if he was wearing a vest, I'll go ahead and put the vest over top. Because now I know that this pocket here is going to be covered up, so I don't need to worry about yep. that. And then I'll go ahead and put the suit jacket on. And this helps me imagine how these different layers are interacting. And now I know that, okay, those lines need to be inked. These lines need to be inked, and so on. The same kind of principle as you think about when you're drawing through in your pencil stage uh, with, the, with the anatomy, I think about when I'm drawing the layers of clothing, so I'll actually draw all those layers. And I know that, again, it sounds super neurotic, but uh, it's a way to sort of safeguard myself. Good planning. That it, yeah. it actually, I don't think that's neurotic at all. I, and it's, uh, I, I would imagine depending on the kind of style you're going for, depending on your familiarity with the subject. I mean, perhaps if you've already drawn that gentleman in the, in the suit, you, you really know, oh, okay, this is how the... I, I, you can have a convincing feel without worrying about those details, perhaps. But uh, that's, that's really cool. I think I'll start doing that to, um, to gain that familiarity because I certainly don't have it yet. 
it helped me a lot with with being able to visualize how fabric interacts with with bodies. And I mean, and you do have um, you or at least you've looked at uh, Bern Hogarth's dynamic wrinkles and drapery. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's a great resource for at least understanding how the different folds interact at different points of the body. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that like, you know, the folds on the pant leg are going to go in such a way if the knee is bent forward. Absolutely. Right. So, but yeah, but I, I think like penciling each layer of the clothing helps a lot to uh, help you visualize that and also begin to think about like we were talking about a second ago in components. So it's breaking down the realms of concern, making it a little bit more manageable. Uh, I love relearning that lesson pretty much constantly. <laughs> it, this is a nice, uh, I, I, ex, uh, a, a perfect example of that because you can understand, well, okay, cool, I have to break things down into separate concerns and, and how are these things affecting one another. But then if you don't quite have the vocabulary or if you're not sort of stopping and reminding yourself of the vocabulary you already have to help break the problem down, it uh, obviously it will be hard to, you know, you're harder to accomplish that same goal. Um, interesting. Here's one of the ones I've I've had a lot of trouble with in the past. Mm. Is the looking up at the face shot? Mm-hmm. Because there's a lot of things going on here. One, you have to turn a head around inside of your mind. You got the other eye syndrome, right? The hardest thing to draw, a lot of artists say, is the other eye. Yep. And then the distortion that happens on the lower part of the face. Well, here's that nose. The distortion that happens on the lower part of the face as you progress it down toward the chin. And then also, I mean, it's like, okay, we can see in our head a jawline of a character and mm. the way it relates to the neck. But now we've got a whole new problem here because the jaw is actually interacting with the neck. We, we see that connection a little bit more clearly where the jaw actually becomes part of the neck. And so when we get to the inking layer or the inking stage, and I'll start inking this. Is this showing up okay? Oh, it's showing up, yeah, very well. I mean, there's also a little bit of foreshortening going on on the mouth because it's, let's see, so the the characters, I don't know which, yeah, speaking in left and right, essentially that character's left side of, it, of his mouth is far closer to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you've accu a represented that accurately because it is a part of the volume of the head, and then and, and that portion of the head is is closer and jutting out. And so, uh, I mean, it makes sense to have the mouth um, gaping more on that side, and and that's that's not a necessarily right. thing either. Um, and then how the jaw also what what um, uh, the jaw can essentially um, disappear into the neck. Um, exactly. Where you, I mean, see if I drew it's standing out, but I think it depends on the lighting and stuff. Where it I mean, does sure, depend on the lighting. Um, sometimes the main part of the chin that you you end up um, really getting to uh, to see is the is like that corner, and and then maybe like what the 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 bone coming in a little bit, and then all of a sudden it depending on the the detail of your line work and all that all of a sudden this this whole section in here may be far less emphasized yeah um, and like so when you look at looking at the face straight on it's like you want to draw that lower jaw clearly defined with a line right mm -hmm. because oh, yeah. you need that i mean right that that looks natural but if i were to do that here look how weird that looks right like, cause that, that line shouldn't be there. That's where we would do it either with shading, like so, or tones. We can create that sense of dimension there, but we if you define it with a, a distinct line like that, it just starts looking bizarre. It does. Right? So, and, and turning the head around like that, and then also, even when you work cartoony, so if I were to go, say, like more of a pseudo-manga style, 
and there's the nose, and here's like a pseudo <clears throat> Toriyama kind of look. This is another one that my students always have trouble with is that other eye and how I'll draw. This is the great thing about drawing in a digital program like Manga Studio. Because now, okay, that looks perfectly natural to us or, or, you know, pretty good. It's not great considering, you know, I, I can do much better than this. But if I get rid of all these lines, and then you were to take and measure this eye versus this eye, look at the distances, right? It's like, it's so hard for us to understand that, yeah, the second eye should be narrower than the first eye. The eye that's farther away from us should be narrower than the first eye. And that's something that I see a lot of people screw up, uh, you know, like beginning cartoonists, they would do. So going back and putting in that face again. Whoa, that's a weird forehead. Right. <laughs> and so if I were... If I were to draw the eye the same width as this, right, whoops, roughly, I gotta erase the other one first. There we go. Suddenly we lose all sense of dimension there, right? Yeah, and some art styles uh, call for that. I mean, so was it, I don't know what, what is the history on using perspective? Is it something that, artists started to do and then we lost during the dark ages or whatnot but i remember you know like medieval tapestries a lot of right uh, yeah a lot of the renderings you see of of the human figure it's i mean it's as if everyone's been run over by a, a steamrolling machine which hadn't even been invented yet because you know it's everyone everyone's flat it's al almost like everyone's uh, part flounder <laughs> right so yeah two eyes on the on, on one side of their head and then Picasso found yeah. that again. Yeah, oh, you're right. Yep. And but it's yeah, almost I mean, like it depends on the art style that you're going for. What? Oh no, the the yeah the the it's almost like the summary of a face as opposed to, and and the symbols that comprise the face, not actually the um the the perception of people in a 3D volume space, which we typically perceive if you know. Yeah, sighted people with two eyes experience all the time. Yep. So that's that's one of the ones. The other eye and the upshot, and then um, I want to kick it back to you. What's one that the, another one that gives you issues? Oh gosh, I mean, fashion is really kind of a mega one. And then obviously, I mean, it's it's a, what else gives me issues? Um. It's a little bit meta, but thinking about uh, source material and flavoring, I think that some of that is, is a, um, a cultural thing where I almost, um, I can be comfortable just working out of my imagination, but uh, I see and recognize through observing how other artists work how important it can be to, to work with source material, such as pictures of buildings going around town. Like I remember... Um, seeing part of the making of Scott Pilgrim and how uh, uh, Brian Lee O'Malley uh, went around to the locations and he took a lot of photographs. And yep. I'm not sure the technique he used to then bring them into the book, but they are very accurately representative, representative of their subject material. So anything from locations to uh, specific logos on things and shirts and that where it's like, how much of the real world do I include or not? And so far, yeah. I've really just said, well, it's all imagination. I just kind of fill in blanks and, and or leave blanks. One of the things that, and again, see, I always feel like I have to apologize for this. I always feel like I have to say, like, I know this is really crazy and neurotic, but... Um, everything is an opportunity in your comic. When you're building a world, everything's an opportunity for thinking about what is it and why is it so okay so like in the front there was uh, a bunch of different cars i had scenes where the characters were going to be driving cars and then there was the natural question what kind of car would this particular character drive and so if it's thirsty and Knox, uh my two teenage boys they're not going to have a nice car uh and if they do oh. there's good there's got to be a reason for that. There's got to be, okay, why would they have a nice car? And that has to be a story point, or, or I have to address it somehow. It can't just be, uh, well, he just happens to drive a Dodge Viper, that's all. Uh, 
because I like to draw Dodge Vipers, you know. Um, I, you know, stories have to have a plausibility to them to some extent. So everything was an opportunity to ask, why would they have this? So like, even like the design of Rex's apartment, uh, I decided for a sparsely decorated apartment because, uh, this is an old man who has like sufficient pain in his past. And I thought he, he should have very few things to remind him of that past. Uh, but then I thought, well, he's also kind of an old grandpa character, so he should have an old grandpa car. And so that's when I decided, okay, well, what kind of what kind of cars do I think of when I think of old grandpa cars? Oh, I think of an old Delta 88 from like 1976. Mm. And so then I just looked up, you know, uh, Google image search and found as many pictures as I could of an old Delta 88. Um, that's funny. Has, which has a really nutty grill, by the way. Regency. What's that? I used to drive a old Delta 98. Oh man, really? That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Love those cars, those big boxy cars. I mean, it's, it was partially because uh, I. Go ahead, Rob. Sorry, I I was I was really feeling your statement as far as loving those old boxy cars, and uh, yeah, it, it uh, had a really. Um, I mean, some some cars they end up being on either end of the spectrum. Both the older generation has them, and the young kids have them. Uh, it, it's kind of a funny, funny way where that can work out because th those cars probably have been around a while, so they're more affordable for uh, youngsters. And then at the same time, some um, some folks who are aware of uh, you know being tightly control of their budget or whatnot, they're going to hold on to those cars and keep them around. So it's kind of funny. Two ends of the spectrum there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I just, it, it, I love those cars just because those are the cars that I rode around in when I was a really little kid. It's from that time of my life, you know, being like an eight year old, that was the kind of cars that my parents and grandparents had. Uh, plus they're just, I think they're fun to draw. Uh, the old Delta 88 in particular had a really nutty grill that made it very difficult to draw in perspective. Um, but then I think about it in another comic I did called The Replacements, um, I had a, the, one of the protagonists was an uptight, uh, somewhat harried museum registrar named Helen, and it was take, took place in modern day. So I thought, well, what kind of uh, car would she drive? Well, she'd probably drive one of those new VW Beetles. So, you know, you get a bunch of reference material on that. So everything is an opportunity to express something about the characters in the world, right? And so... You know, the replacements took place in the Southwest. I was living in the Southwest at the time, so it was super easy to get reference material. I just went for walks, right? But um, so it was not to just, you know, Southwest, that means you got palm trees. Oh, yeah. Which are different flora and fauna. But there's different kinds of palm trees. There's the tall, skinny ones. But then if you've ever been to the Southwest, there's ones that are shaped kind of like pineapple-y, and they have a really rough bark. And they and the the fronds stick up more, like the top of a pineapple. Like this would be like the size of a person next to it. Oh yeah. And unless I went, unless I went to go on walks and do my research and look at this stuff, you know, I wouldn't know that there's different kinds of palm trees. I would think of this kind all the time. Uh, the tall, skinny ones that we see, like on desert islands, the coconuts, like in Gilligan's Island, right? Um, yep. But uh, but there was all kinds of different palm trees, and then also like, okay, well, what kind of small shrubbery do you see in the desert? And like, so when we think of shrubbery in the Midwest, we think of more of like a wheat-like, grassy stalk. But everything in the desert is very gnarled. So I learned very quickly that, oh, I'm going to have to make sure that whenever I draw a shrubbery, I'm using very angular, oh, I got my stroke correction on, very angular lines to represent these gnarled and twisted branches. Or like a Palo Verde tree. I don't know if you've ever seen, you've probably seen those, right, Rob? Those greenish, they got like a green smooth bark, but like the, the branches are all twisted out of craziness like this. Interesting. Reminds me of a banyan tree, but uh, not... Yeah, it is a little I've bit like that. Cool. So, yeah, everything is an opportunity to express the personality of your story, right? So, yeah, I mean, when, like what you're talking about with Brian Lee O'Malley does, I think that that's probably what more, more storytellers should do. Um, what kind of shoes do the characters that. wear? What's yeah. that? I'm starting to, to pick up on that. Uh, 
yet another thing as far as tackling the next uh, chapter of my of my story and, and realizing that there's uh, it's it's interesting to tackle something that that's a, a little bit uh, conceptual, right? Where some stories, it, I mean, think of I mean, it's an older movie, but like uh, Gattaca or something where, yeah, I mean, I guess there is a lot of ex explicit, specific um, examples of their society, but in some ways it's kind of simplified. Or if you think about like, uh, you know, Batman, the, the cartoon series, or um, there's there's some stylization. Oh, man, also... like Batman, the animated series from the 90s? Yeah, very simplified. We got some, we got some lag going on, but yeah... Yeah, you talk. Yeah, it was like uh, the the Batman animated series from the '90s had like that Art Deco 1930s kind of look in the, in the first couple seasons, and I mean it evolved and it morphed. But yeah, keep, continue. I'm sorry, Rob. No worries. I mean, yeah, it's it. Um, well, okay, I would say it it had a very specific Art Deco from time to time, but it also went sort of simple shapes and it's a bit futuristic but then it had that retro flavor too with occasional specific art deco examples but i don't think they 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 painstakingly rendered from what i remember there was a lot of abstraction in the background going on so you mm -hmm. would have yep uh scenes that that i mean they had relevant details but there was a lot of detail left out on purpose and that has a different effect on a story, and I guess I was I, so far I, I'm in in you know my main comic that I've put the most time into, I've I've uh, taken that approach, but I'm re I'm seeing how it's it, it 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 shows some weaknesses as far as the, the you know what if you want to say something specific about your characters, but just based on their kind of shoes, like you said, or um, mm -hmm. perhaps. Not just that they wear a T-shirt. So what? What's on it? What band do they like? More specific than the ones that are that I make up in the story, right? I mean, a little more of the feel of of uh, the world and time they're from. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm doing two different kinds of boots right now. Just different yeah, kind of boots tell you an awful lot. Yep. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah, totally. It's a combat boot, or like so, like you know, a lace up combat boot, or you know, like more like a oh riding boot, and then yeah, like um, Thirsty Knox and Gibson in the front all had very di different shoes to represent the different kinds of boys they were. So Thirsty wore the the Chuck Taylors, the I think they were high tops actually. He wore the Chuck Taylor high tops, which is like a standby nerd shoe, right? That's to say, like, okay, he's a nerdy kid. He's kind of cool, but he's kind of not. Uh, Knox wore the more traditional um, kind of Reebok casual athletic shoes. Mm. Kind of padded top. And Gibson wore Vans. Remember Vans? I do. To emphasize the fact that, oh, he's a skater kid. Um Kind of a hipster kid who, a, pr a proto hipster, pre hipster who, you know, likes the Beastie Boys and, um, you know, likes playing the Tony Hawk video games. So, <laughs> yeah, just three different kinds of shoes that were all uh, chosen specifically to emphasize that particular aspect of the character. Now, it's not something where I'm, I'm thinking that the readers are going to necessarily pick up on it, but maybe some did. But it contributes, it's all contributing pieces, right? Exactly. It's not like someone has to look for every single detail. And so I suppose part of the puzzle for me is that's that is a challenge is now that I'm caring more about that what details to include and which ones to not worry about, right? Because mm -hmm. essentially I'm saying I want to worry about more details, but I know it would be not that I'm ha It'd be a little bit incongruous, and it would probably slow me down too much if I started all of a sudden occur, you know, caring about every single thing, every single character war to a high, high degree. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to build up to it and if you know see what level of detail makes sense. Um, what other? What? How about you, Jersey? What? Um, oh, turn it back on me. Yeah. Um, Oh man, I'll tell you what, hair. Oh, hair, hair is a big one. Yep. Um, 
I like drawing hair, but I don't really feel like I got the hang of it yet. Um, and I wish, I wish uh, Manga Studio was working a little bit faster than this. Um, playing with different hair types, and one of the ways that I'm I'm getting around it right now, and this comes from taking some lead into art courses with people like Krishna Sadasvam and Brandon Dayton, uh, and and Tyler James, is not that that was an ad. I'm just just this is something that I picked up from them and I was really grateful for it was thinking in shapes. Um, so like if I started with, I'm going to go back to my pencil layer and I really like when I'm drawing characters hair, like I'll take character Galen from the front, for instance, who has a very angular face, very dour expression. It's basically the starting point of Galen, but what mm -hmm. counterbalances that severe look and attitude and disposition and actually, he's always got his lids half down. That's one of the rules of Galen. Um, <laughs> is he has this beautiful swooshy hair. So it's all smooth lines on his hair to emphasize that, yes, he is very severe and he's very unpleasant, but he's very beautiful. Uh, right? So, I mean, I like doing that part of the hair. I like doing, like, even on characters like Thirsty, where it's, it's all these little curly lines that make up his hair. But I'm always thinking about like the contours and, and how those contours contribute to the shape. But I never really think about the shape itself. So when I'm working on this new batch of character designs that I'm working on right now for a project, I'm starting to go, okay, I'll take the pencil layer, and then I'll just go like this. Oh, or, yeah. You know, or this. And I'll just break it down into, okay, instead of thinking about the lines think about how that con or how the actual um mass will interact with the face to give me a sense of what i want to do with it first and this is something krishna taught us in his uh creating crazy characters class right oh was start with on me <laughs> uh i have not thought of the i haven't th thought of my characters the same since yep <laughs> It's that that outline. I realize it. Uh, it's it's just that it, as far as picking one thing to be concerned about that helps uh, build a foundation for for better communicating the character. It's just, it's wonderful, um, and yeah. it's interesting that you're pointing out that you can use that to tackle the hair, also. It it there's a character that I designed for the book who has roughly this kind of hairstyle. Mm. and it came out of just playing around with just making, just putting different triangles, circles, and squares on people's heads. And uh, then I got to do all those little sushi lines that I like. But the inspiration... Oh, shape, nice. It started with, started with that shape, right? So then I just drew a bunch of circles. Oops. Man, the circles are not coming together. If I work slowly, it's fine. You know, I'll start with a circle or whatever their general head shape is. Like, oh, I want them to have a narrow head. Or I want them to have more of, you know, a, a, a cherubic face. Pronounced cheeks. Whichever. I'll do. I'll start there and then I'll go in and say, okay, let's try putting a square on it. Let's try putting, you know, this kind of triangle. Maybe uh, this kind of triangle. That kind of triangle. And just be playful with it and just see what, what jumps out at me, and then start throwing some lines over top of that to get my... Yeah, that's very cool. That's a good, it's a good approach. So the, yeah, again, looking for something that reinforces the, the character. Um, so do you think the... That would be like your your primary method now, or would you would you ever go back to building things up with incremental swooshing? No, I mean, it, it, like you were saying about Krishna's class, uh, it it completely it's it's like seeing the world in a whole new way. I mean, I I can't not see it that way now, right? So, um, I was working on a character design where um, I came up with this kind of hair configuration, and she had kind of like these messy bangs. And then these long pieces here, and it was kind of messy in the back. And it came out of 
doing this kind of shape, um, kind of a triangle coming off the back of the head, right? That's what I started with. And then I thought, well, you know, maybe I got this kind of uh, whim to say, well, maybe she needs curly hair. This particular character, maybe, I mean, she's got kind of like a, a certain aspect of her personality that's a little bit more like tightly wound. And maybe I can, uh, can emphasize that through a curly hair. And I couldn't get curly hair to do the same thing and follow that same shape of that triangle coming off of the back of the head um, the same way where it felt appropriate to the shape. Does that make sense? It's like I was so convinced that, okay, this this point coming off the back of the head is the way to do it. That's what looks right for this particular character. Uh, mm -hmm. And to do that, I need her hair to be relatively straight. It can be wavy, but, but relatively straight. It can't be, if I do it like this, then she looks like she's got like a, a bad perm. Oh, that sure. Yeah. It's interesting. Like that, that shape sort of said somehow the physics of hair wouldn't just, um, curly hair just wouldn't do that really. Um, I mean, you, you at least, could, at least not without looking like it was intentionally styled to make dad angry or something. Right. Sure. Well, I mean, speaking of the fifth <laughs> element, um, well, um, what was yeah, that gentleman? Actually, that? Yeah, uh, Roddy. What was his name? Anyway, he had that super huge oh. curly cone, like a unicorn horn. Yeah, perm thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what What is that actor's name? It's something Tucker, isn't it? Tucker, Chris Tucker. Thank you, Chris remember, Tucker. But Chris yeah. Tucker, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that that that's that's one way I've I've begun to reinvestigate the whole idea because I used to just start like I was showing you before uh, when I was working with character designs I would just start by throwing strands down instead of shapes down. And Kr Krishna got me thinking about backing up and sort of doing the squint test on things, giving me more ideas. And and again, it's it's a low risk way to investigate. Like you know, it's like sometimes uh, I think I, I see this happening with my teenage students. Uh, they get a little bit disheartened by the fact that, oh, you mean you got to draw a page three times? I'm like, not only do you have to draw a page three times sometimes, oh, but you got to draw a character like 50, 60 times before you even feel like you got them right. Just look in a, in a concept art book. You see all these different versions of a character before they land on the one that's right. And that can be kind of uh, disheartening when you're sitting down to a page, like, I'm going to start designing some characters. Well, the great thing about guys like Krishna is they teach us that, well, don't, do the final one. Do a whole bunch of this kind of loose stuff to to exactly. whittle down to the final ten candidates, and then take it from there. Right. It's yeah. It's it's a it's it's a really good approach. Make it inexpensive to try, and explore. Yep. And uh, yeah, that, that's that's another area that 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 I would uh, that I'm really hoping to practice and improve is. Uh, well, using I, honestly, maybe it, it's it's sort of taking Krishna's shape approach and then starting to apply it to more things besides character design, but sort of take that that uh, fast and loose use shapes to assemble scenes even, and then uh, choose where I want to expound and add some more detail from there. Um, <clears throat> because I think a lot of yeah, concept like artists. Yeah, level. Yeah, thumbnailing or even um, during a little bit, well, even a little bit beyond thumbnailing. Um, very much like a concept artist. I'll try to dig um, I mean, up I some of my... Oh, cool. Um, I see a lot of uh, examples of that kind of thing in, in Imagine Effects. Imagine Effects. Uh, that is a magazine for uh, sci-fi and fantasy art. It has a lot of um, a lot of people who digitally paint and physically paint, and it sort of it celebrates both uh, you know people that are are, are practicing you know, early professionals, people who have very established careers. It does a lot of um, sort of a uh, lot of lot of tutorials and whatnot. It's a magazine out of the UK, where evidently the UK seems to somehow fund more variety of interesting magazines I like. And it's not like I go around buying them all. Imagine Effects is pretty much the only one, um, but that that I still purchase or whatnot. But because they're they're kind of expensive to import, but um, I don't know. 
it's not too bad if you subscribe to, you know, get a discount off of the uh, newsstand price. But anyway, it, it's, um, I, I've been a reader of that for a while, and it, there's there's a lot of examples of people who, who use uh, rapid, sketchy approaches to explore ideas. And that's not just limited to character shape and style. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I. I. I think. Uh, I think. I think Krishna's Krishna's look at things in terms of shape, and we we should actually mention real quick uh, that we should make a plug for the Polytechnicast that you did with Krishna because that was really good. Oh, cool! Thanks. So we, we, tell us about that one that you did. Okay. Um, well, uh, let's see. Krishna and I, Krishna and I um, took, took a bit of time to talk about uh, his approach to uh, user interface design for PC weenies because I noticed being into both comics, web comics, and UI design that uh, just before I got to know Krishna even, that this is a guy who keeps... Uh, refining how he's presenting his comics. He's caring about the UI and the experience on his site. And uh, it was just fun to watch, like, over a, a course of a few years. I mean, he, he does a bunch of iterations every year, and it just keeps getting tighter and tighter, more refined. And I think it flexes, too, as his goals tend to change, like, perhaps as far as how he's... Um, what kind of ad arrangements he currently has and whatnot. And it was, it was neat to, to sort of get into it uh, also because he, he had recently uh, done some updates um, to try to help new readers um, get, um, just basically address the needs of new readers in, in ways that uh, he hadn't before. So um, to bring them into a story and whatnot. Anyway, it was a lot of fun to delve into that. So on top of on top of also being like a great teacher and conceptual artist, he's also an awesome guy to talk to to pick his brain about UI design and UX design. Uh, yeah, super smart guy. Great episode of the Polytechnicast. We should include a link in the show notes. Uh, I just pulled up on the screen uh, the Thirsty Knox and Gibson redesigns that I did recently, where I was thinking a lot about these different kinds of ways that clothing interacts um, mm -hmm. and body language. Uh, and then also what kind of lines they use and what kind of hairstyles, like how to emphasize the difference between their personalities with just the lines I use to render their hair. So, uh, you know, you look at Gibson, and it's all about balloony, blousey shapes, right? And his shirt overlaps his pants to emphasize that, that it's, um, it's a bigger shirt than what the other boys are wearing. Look at how Knox's shirt is actually like, uh, sucked right into the contour of his body, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's a tight shirt, but then it's got like the the big bulges at the top with a little bit of the flare out uh, to emphasize that it's tight. But like it's also emphasizing that like the, the, that's, that's muscle there, kids. That's not just like a blousey sleeve. It's like it's it's snug around him. Whereas thirsty is somewhere in between. It's it's following his contour, but also the sleeves just drape off like Gibson's. Whereas Knox's are really tight. Uh, Knox is is more comfortable with his body than the other two boys. And that's what I wanted to emphasize with him. Uh, his body language is relaxed, slou or slou uh, slumping arms, leaning forward with the neck, but with a smile, with a uh, engaging look to some degree. Receptive, thirsty is more withdrawn, even though he's got the same. His shoulders are more drooped. He's not relaxed. He is guarded. Uh, whereas Gibson is expansive, right, with his pose. So yeah, all this stuff is deliberate, right? At least you try to be. It it, it is, oh, and, and the, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, the, the uh, last point I wanted to make is that Gibson's shark attack shirt, right? And that also emphasizes that this is a guy who's not cool. He is an exhibitionist. He thinks he's being funny. And we all knew that guy who wore the who farted or shark attack shirt. But, okay, sorry, done. No, totally. Um, no, it's it's a... It, I, I don't know. I, I like seeing these examples. And um, I look forward to trying to add more of those details. I'm not trying to convey, like, I blew off all sort of specific concern with trying to design my characters, but I, I just I have a I have a more refined palette now as far as my tastes have changed, and uh, I re, I just I, I basically it's like leaving money on the table. These these yeah. character designs could be doing more for my storytelling. Yeah. 
Well, we've got about like three seconds of latency going on with this video. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my my thing, and we should wrap up in, in any way pretty soon here. Uh, but it was a fun experiment. Yeah, we could stop sharing our screens, and then we can do this. We can just uh, make this video bigger, and everybody can see our big happy faces. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yep, boom. So, uh, hey, Rob, uh, this was fun. It was fun doing a little bit of drawing with you, even if there was a, little, a few technological hiccups. Uh, we're still here, at least. And uh, we should take this moment to say that this episode is going to be airing on Friday, so that means that we have time to say to everybody, uh, there's only a few days left to sign up for Tyler James's workshop, uh, the Absolute Consents. Uh, that's at Lean Into Art slash workshops. That's how. That that's the only way that we. The only means we have for you to support what we're doing. If you, if you enjoy this, if you like the podcast that we put together, uh, a great way to help pat us on the back and keep this thing going is to sign up for one of our workshops. And uh, the next one is with Tyler James, who is an accomplished cartoonist, uh, a lot of hard-won knowledge about conventioning. If you've ever been to a convention, uh, like Rob and I have, uh, and spent a lot of money to uh, to, um, to to go and experience that all that fun, uh, you may have wondered, boy, how, I wish I could get more out of this thing. This is a great workshop for that. Uh, we just did a test run. We posted, we updated the post uh, at leanintoart.com/workshops with a video teaser. And in that video teaser, there's like this uh, nine-step plan that uh, that Tyler used to basically make money on the show before he even went to the show. It is not a sleazy thing that he did. It's a very logical, clear-thinking way to leverage his value as a cartoonist with his fans to uh, help sort of get pre-orders going uh, on the show. So but by the time he got there, not only did he have sales already made, but he managed to create a buzz around his table – which resulted in more sales. So that's all in, the, in the, the, the preview video, but there's 50 more things that he has to share on how to maximize your experience at a convention, right? It's, it's wild. It's one of those things where I think uh, a lot of us as artists can, I mean, we, okay, so we, can, we did this whole podcast this time about uh, trying to talk about, well, what are we trying to uh, improve or tackle? What's difficult in, in communicating our, our visual art and drawing? what subjects and and we talked a lot about storytelling and how you want to do that and so we're we're building up certain strengths but a lot of us will have well a big weaknesses when it comes to business and how do how do you tackle that side of it when you you, you want to do your art as a service you see it working you see others successful at it and basically Tyler is someone who has put a lot of work into both uh figuring out a way that works for himself but also wondering how that functions and he has put together a workshop that asks those questions to help you build your own approach for accomplishing that that's a good way of putting it it's not as simple like just do this kids it's it, he really is demonstrating how thinking about your art as a business will help make your convention experiences better and it's not just as simple as well that guy's got a vertical banner i just got to get a vertical banner that's all no it's thinking about what is your specific value as a cartoonist and here's some thinking strategies. Here's some really good questions to ask so that you can find your own uniquely. Like going back to Krishna again, one of the things that Krishna likes to talk about is um, Seth Godin's purple cow principle. How do you stand out? How do you make yourself unique? How do you uh, differentiate yourself, especially at a Comic-Con where everybody else there is a cartoonist, right? So, yeah, it's, uh, we've, I've sat through the, uh, the, the, the dry run of the workshop. It's an amazing workshop. Uh, so, yeah, only a couple days left to sign up at leanintoart.com slash workshops. And it'd be a great way to support the show and get some amazing material that comes with, if you can't make it to the live event, you get a download of the video with no DRM, never expires. So, all right, yeah. I want to keep that one a little bit on the brief side because we've been pl pushing it pretty hard. I know, we Everybody are who's been... tempting fate with Adobe Connect. Fair, <laughs> fair, fair point, Jersey. I mean, Adobe, it's been fair enough, whatever, but I, obviously... Yeah. That leg. We want we want this video to see, succeed and get out into your hands. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the workshop's gonna go great because we're not gonna be straining Adobe Connect as much with like two live drawing feeds plus two video feeds. So exactly. Single presenter, not that big of a deal for. Right. But uh, but thank you, Rob. And I want to give you a chance to. Is there anything else that's going on that you want to point people at that you're excited about? 
Oh. We never uh, plug ourselves. Besides, we plug the workshops, but we never say anything else that we're doing, you know? <laughs> I am uh, I'm hard at work working on some workshops that I want to uh, share more about uh, in, in the future. And in, in a nutshell, I've I've got a workshop that, I, that that we've teased a while back about making a video game, and I've got one already in existence that's about um, use, designing a video game based on your comic. So you could take narrative and use that as a, base, as a basis for a game design. Well. This expounds that into not just that initial planning. It makes it into, well, here's how you can build a game. And I've tried to make that like extra fun and, and, uh, and unique because I made the workshop as a game also. So Still looking forward to this. Very excited about it, Rob. So hopefully that'll be next month or, the, well, in the next 60 days. How about that? Exactly. I'm it's I'm working hard at it, and you know it's it's like a uh, we sell no wine before it's time kind of thing. To borrow an old <laughs> cliche marketing phrase. Man, that is that is not a comparison that you want to make. Uh, your, your workshop is not going to be like Paul Masson wine. I guarantee it. Is is that bad wine? I don't know. Oh yeah, Paul. Oh Paul Masson. I I got it once. Uh, Mark Rudolph and I, when we were recording an art and story podcast years ago, we got a bottle of Paul Masson because of the the Orson Welles commercials where we will sell no wine before it's time. And whew. Uh, well, some people might enjoy it. I didn't enjoy it all that much. Uh, it well, was, it was. It's not meant to be a. Uh, um, well, anyway, they had yeah. a good. <laughs> Let's get out of here before we start defaming people. We don't want to do that. Exactly. We don't uh, want. It, it's it's a lovely product. Uh, so okay, well, yes, we will be updating everybody with information about that workshop in the near future. And uh, I don't have anything else that I. Yeah. I, I'm, so you don't. You always have stuff going on at comicsaregreat.com, though. There we go. It's always, yes, always worth checking out the 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 stream of, of awesome and interesting things that you're doing on that interview based format show that also has a really good local flavor because of the Ann Arbor District Library and all that kind of stuff it's uh um it's an example that hopefully uh, more libraries will get inspired from and whatnot it's I hope so awesome. I'm doing I'm doing a talk on it actually at uh, the Michigan Library Association conference this summer sometime I forget when but uh, I'm going to be moderating a panel on on what we've done at AADL so Nice. Hopefully, we'll get some more libraries, at least in the Michigan area, on board. But uh, okay, well, thank you everybody for downloading and listening and playing along. Until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and LeanIntoArt.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I've been Rob Stenzinger, also of LeanIntoArt.com and InteractiveStoryteller.com. Put a dash in there, and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, dash by.